So we're here to talk about uh, businesses without bosses, self-management with philosophy. Um, I'm pretty passionate about this stuff, and as I made this presentation, I couldn't find a way to articulate my passion for it without just uh, writing a couple paragraphs that now I'm going to read to you. So this presentation is not an academic exercise in how to work differently. It's about how to work with people in a way that's healthy, where you can bring all of yourself and where it's safe to express feelings, and even more useful to stay rational. Holacracy is a 53-page rule book. It's also a personal journey for me, a multi-year practice, and a daily team sport. It's about purpose, responsibility, accountability, asking hard questions, thinking before you say yes, saying no safely, accepting imperfections, and trusting others to take care of themselves without you needing to keep them safe or take care of them. It's about being healthy at work. And if you're a leader, it's about how you can stop trying so hard. It's about how you can really get out of the way of people and let them lead themselves without you needing to play the hero. And if you don't buy all this purpose shit, that's fine. You can just increase your meeting efficiency 300% and get unstuck on issues that have been stuck for years. You'll still benefit. OK, so that's my little diatribe. Thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> um, so our organizations, we're going to talk a little about where we are, where we've been, and where we are. Uh, our, our organizations are stuck. Um, Polls say that 80% of employees are either not engaged or actively disengaged at work. And this is a global study. 70% um, of change management efforts don't succeed. So the cards are really stacked against us in terms of getting real change at work. Um, managers don't have all the information they need, they, and they can't cope with the complexity that they face these days. And people can't resolve issues on their own. They need to resort to a heroic leader to save them. Um, the organization just can't adapt to its changing environment. Um, now, not to say that we haven't been successful, um, but the burden of management is now too great. And the environment is just too complex. People read management books all the time. I don't know how much good it does. You go to workshops, you come back, you try something, you can't do it. And a lot of this has to do with the structure, the environment we're in. So the way I see it, we have three options. We can continue with the status quo. We can create superhuman leaders, which is what a lot of people try to do and try to be. Or we can take the work of management and break it down and distribute it across the organization. People are always talking about this. Think like a startup. Big organizations, companies like AmFam, they want to think like a startup. So. Why, why do we want to think like a startup? And what is it that startups do that other organizations can't? And this is a question I'd like to actually hear from you guys. Any thoughts? The first thing I think is uh, when I was new at the organization, I think it's one of the reasons they hired me, is because I was asking questions that if I was creating something from scratch, well, why wouldn't we look at it this way? Why, it was just a different set of eyes. So our school was around since 1972. Wow. I didn't know any of the history. so. I came in and just said, okay, well, here's some thoughts. And it was a good, it was a good, um, I think that's one of the reasons I got hired was that I didn't know the history. So it just helps you do some perspective taking. Yeah, and so we need to depart from history if we're going to have any kind of change. Any other thoughts about startups? Yeah. So I've been fortunate enough to work for a, you know, a rather large behemoth conservative Midwestern insurance company that one of their core values is agility, um, but I've always been from the side of things from more of a, uh, I guess, a, an innovative entrepreneurial area within the company, So, but I have also worked in a cube farm, so seeing and hearing this, you know, I definitely witnessed it firsthand, but when I think of that term right there, I think of agility of itself, you know, when I think of a startup, I don't think of a huge company with a bunch of people, I think of a smaller team, and uh, somewhat similar to what you said, you know, if there's an idea that's present or uh, a different way of doing it, things they're able to do it in a quick manner. They need to determine if it's going to work or determine if it's not going to work. And we'll talk about some of the criteria that that make it safe to try these things and some of the things that get in our way in traditional organizations. We also think that yeah. there's like an excitement in a startup, like just a passion that isn't a thing in the day-to-day 
day-to-day establish organizations in the way it's always been done. Can't change anything, but a startup is like the possibilities are endless. And people are passionate about it. And what is what is it that people don't have that if they had it, they could be they could have that passion? What like why not? Why why can't you have a big organization with people not being like like a big like people maybe don't think they're able to affect, affect change? Not able to affect change, sure. Yeah. And what happens when we try? It's like roadblocks all yeah. everywhere. It's yeah. hard, change is hard. Yeah. Whatever. So. What, what, so what we're going to talk about is how to switch from change is hard to change is inevitable. Let's make it safe. Uh, so this is a uh, what you might think of as a traditional management hierarchy. Um, where and and it's actually just a hierarchy. Uh, where else do we see hierarchies in the world? Hier hierarchies of people. Families. Families. It's like social class. Social class. Sure. Any others? Government, totally. Um, I wrote down a few here, and and if I like continue on and you have a thought, just stop me and just say what you're thinking. Okay, it's fine. Um, so in, with when we look back to the origin of management hierarchy, we can we talk, can talk about kingdoms, families, family structures, the military. There are lots of examples of hierarchies, and they've all been very successful. They've gotten us really far. Everything around us, this building, those roads out there, it was all built on hierarchies. So it's not to say that hierarchies are bad or have failed us. It's just that they're, they're creating a world that is so complex that hierarchies can no longer manage it. Um, so if we go all the way back to the beginning, this is uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor. He created the concept of scientific management in 1910. And he's credited with inventing the first method of organizing work. Uh, his goal was to improve efficiency. And this is at a time when people were, craftsmen were making horseshoes and nails by hand, uh, using whatever techniques they knew, sharing knowledge with each other in kind of a bespoke way. And he said, no, we can, we can do better. We can model what's going on here, and we can systematize it so people can do it faster. He's credited with being the first management consultant. Um, so scientific management had some good things. It created a 200 to 400% increase in efficiency. I'll pick that. Reliably increased consistency in terms of the materials that were made. And it paved the way for the assembly line. Uh, Ford came, at, came right after uh, Taylor. And it also ushered in a new wave of thinking around production and manufacturing. It basically created a lot. It's laid the foundation for a lot of what has enabled us, uh, enabled us to have the society that we have. However, there were some bad things. Um, Taylor's system enforced management hierarchy and an us versus them mindset. It minimized the individual's sense of contribution and craftsmanship. And it reduced organizations to a system of simple components. So this is a, this is a system, let's just chop it into pieces, optimize each piece, and then we'll have a better system. And it worked to a great extent. But it really ended up treating people like machines. And um, Taylor was unapologetic about this. He was like, you guys are not skilled. We just need the cheapest labor we can get to do this. Let's have a manager figure out the best way. And that thinking has stayed with us for the last 100 years. Your manager knows better, but you're doing the work. What's the disconnect here? Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the obsolescence of scientific management. Um, back then, the idea was that managers knew better than workers and therefore should focus on management and workers should focus on making things. But today, managers are out of touch with the world because they're not exposed to the front lines. And workers are systematically disempowered to do anything about it. So before Taylorism, craftsmen were specialized, skilled workers. They were highly valuable and they had unique insights that were hard to transfer. And after Taylorism, there was a best way to produce most products by modeling it and making, making it explicit and removing the need for craftsmen to make products. Now, this next slide is uh, one of my more controversial opinions, but I would argue that before and after Holacracy, managers, before Holacracy, 
Managers were specialized, skilled workers with valuable skills and unique insights that are hard to transfer. And after Holacracy, there is a best way to organize and break down work and model it, make it explicit. And with that, we can remove the need for managers to run businesses. It might sound like hearsay, but 100 years ago, the idea of breaking down the work of a, a um, blacksmith was, was hearsay. Um, so this is all about the shift from implicit to explicit. And right now, if you look at our uh, organizations, there's all this implicit knowledge. You implicitly go to your boss to ask them for something that they implicitly know, or maybe somebody else knows, and it's actually Sally down the hall that can help you with that, but that's not written down anywhere, so you have to know that. It's all hidden information, it's secret. The, way, like the, the actual way the power works in organizations is secret. And if we can shift from implicit to explicit, then we can really start to get traction on some of these problems. Um, so with Taylor, the worker has secret knowledge that's needed to do the work. Um, and with Taylorism, we document that, and we have processes. And with Holacracy, the organization's knowledge is kept in people, in secret. But when we make it explicit, the organization's knowledge can be documented and referenced. Um, there's another concept here, which is the switch from a complicated environment to a complex environment. And this is kind of intellectual nerdery, but we'll just cover it quickly. Um, Taylorism worked for complicated systems. Big systems that had lots of parts. You could slice it up and look at each part. Like a Swiss watch is complicated. Taylorism doesn't work for complex systems. Um, what are some examples of complex systems? Can you guys think of any? Rainforest. Rainforest. Education, sure. Complex adaptive systems, where else do you see them? SEAL teams in the military. SEAL teams in the military, yep. Any others? Nature. Cities, they're complex, they adapt, but they have no single, single controller. The human body. The internet, complex adaptive system, too big for any one person to understand, and yet it functions. So what are the properties of these complex adaptive systems? There's no centralized system of control. There's no boss. And there are simple rules which give rise to complex behavior. So we can put simple rules in place, and those can give rise to all the complexity that we have with quote unquote management. Um, so, does anyone know what this is? Has anyone ever taken melatonin to fall asleep? This is the uh, enzymatic pathway of melatonin in the human body. You think you take a melatonin and you fall asleep. There's an incredibly complex system of things happening here. How would you like to have to design this? It's absurd, right? And yet we're trying to design these systems in these complex environments. Um, so instead of that, wouldn't it be better if each of these parts could kind of tell the other what it needs through the pathways, which is what it does? It's just no wonder that we're stuck when we're trying to deal with complexity like this. And then cities are another example. No single designer, changes in response to its environment. And like me, if I would have flown here tonight, I could have bought an airplane ticket, taken, a, taken an Uber to the airport, gotten some food at the airport, gotten to my hotel, gotten down here, all without a single authority helping along the way. This is what we, how we want to start thinking when we start thinking about organizations as, um, as these, these complex adaptive systems. What we're talking about here is switching from design to evolution. Moving from organizations that are designed to, to organizations that evolved. So design systems require an intelligent designer. As evolved systems just require simple rules. And again, this is going from mechanism to organism. So how can we do it? How does nature do it? Well, nature breaks it into primitives and lets the primitives self-organize. 
So we can take our management hierarchy and we can break it into roles and policies and other primitives, other simple forms. And this is the change from implicit to explicit. Taking the knowledge in the hierarchy and putting it into an explicit system, into a description of roles and policies. And then we can fill those roles, put people into those roles. But in order to be able to do this, we need to be able to separate the people from the work, which we'll get to in a second. The one thing that Taylor missed, um, holacracy gives anyone the ability to update the structure and the processes of the organization. With Taylorism, only the managers could do it. Only the authorities could do it. Holacracy gives us a way to do this safely. So anybody who's experiencing an issue can actually affect change of that issue. So, okay, now we can actually talk about this. What is Holacracy? Well, concretely, it's a rule book for how to run an organization like an organism. It's a 53-page book. It's called the Holacracy Constitution. Um, and it gives, let's see, what does it do? It's a model for how to break down work. It describes how to distribute authority, gives everyone a voice, and creates immense amounts of clarity. And it's also organizational governance. So what do we mean by that? In, uh, in our republic, in America, we think about um, you know, organization or uh, governance of the people, by the people, for the people. That's not what this is. It's not democracy. It's governance of the organization through the people for the purpose. So we're governing the organization and how it works. The people are doing the work for the purpose of the organization. And again, we're separating the organization from the people here. They're not fused anymore. So how is holacracy different? Um, Holacracy is not a flat system. It's not undifferentiated. It's not democratic. Whoops. It's not an excuse to do whatever you want. There we go. Um, it's not just a software solution, though software helps. It's also not a cultural shift. It doesn't require that you change people's ideas around culture. It's also not a value system. You don't have to have anybody believe anything differently. You don't have to get them on the bus or get their buy-in. It's just a set of rules. You can be a citizen, quote unquote, in a holacracy without holding any special beliefs, as long as you follow the rules. So holacracy tells us how to move in the same direction, and these might sound like things we do with management, how to know what needs to be done, how to know who should do what, how to actually get the work done, and how to remove obstacles along the way. If these things sound familiar, they might be things you think of when you think of management. Organizational alignment, breaking down the work, and removing obstacles. We can automate these tasks. So another way to think of it is holacracy is like a layer and on top of that layer, we have roles, which are dynamic and different based on each business. We have policies and domains that are different based on each business. We have projects that are definitely different based on each business. And then people doing the projects, using the policies and domains in their roles according to the rules. This is another way to think of that framework. Okay, so. We'll get into some key distinctions now. Um, I'd like you guys to think about this question. Trees are to a forest as what are to an organization? People. People? What else? Anything else? Mm -hmm. Trees are to a forest as blank are to an organization. Do you have descriptions? Job descriptions. Roles. roles. You get the prize. The answer is roles. And the reason for this is that right now we think about our organizations as being made of people. But really, people are parts of the organization. 
um, or people aren't parts of the organization. They're the life force of the organization. They, they give it life. An organization is just a construct. It's, a, it's something made up. Um, and until we actually treat it as this abstraction, this group of roles, we're going to be stuck trying to move the people around in ways that they're not designed to do. So you can think of the people as the life force of the organization. And another way to drive this home is to say that the human body has arms and legs, but so does a corpse. The people energize it. OK, so going into role and soul. This is probably what you think of when you think of a conventional management hierarchy. You've got your C-suite, you've got your directors, your managers, and on down the way. In, a, in Holacracy, we switch to roles. So on the right here, we have things that you might recognize. We have an, the organization as a whole. We've got a finance role, an HR role, development role, sales, inside and outside sales. The sales roles are inside the sales circle. Uh, finance is outside the sales circle. Um, what we're doing here is we're differentiating the roles, the job descriptions, from the people. And a person can hold more than one role. In fact, this is a key distinction, which allows you to move resources around, people as resources, and create new roles without having to worry, oh, we don't have anyone who can do that. Well, that's OK. We'll create the role, and we'll separate the concern and fill it later. So uh, for example, in my business, I fill the sales role, the HR role, and the finance role. This is kind of a contrived example, because I work independently. Um, but what you can actually see in this real example, this is uh, a screen from Teal Dog, a product that describes Holacracy implementations. And you can see that I filled these four roles here. Um, I'm in I'm the sales and marketing lead. I'm in development. I am the service delivery person and the bug reporter. And each of these roles has a separate list of accountabilities and a purpose. So when I'm energizing these roles, when I'm doing this work, I think, OK, what does this role need? Not what do I need. What does the role need? Um, and that really helps to depersonalize things and helps you have conversations with people around it in a much more healthy way. What does this role need to be successful? Um, if we zoom in a little bit, we can see this role has four accountabilities, uh, working with outreach champion, authoring proposals, developing sales and marketing resources, and delivering services to customers. These are ongoing processes that this role is accountable for. So when I'm filling the role, it tells me what I should do, and it also lets others know what they can count on me for. If someone comes to me to, if Outreach Champion comes to me and says, hey, I need you to work with me to close new deals, I can say, hmm, does that make sense for this role? And actually look, and yes, it does. Right, so it makes it much clearer to get alignment around what you're working on. But how do I know what I'm allowed to do and what I'm not? Here's how Holacracy answers that question, and this is what's called the golden rule of Holacracy, and this is kind of a mind bender. In the Constitution, it says that as a partner assigned to a role, you have the authority to execute any action you reasonably believe is useful for enacting your role's purpose or accountabilities as long as it doesn't violate another rule of the Constitution or your organization's governance. I'm just going to read part of that again. You have the authority to execute any action you believe is useful for your role's purpose and accountabilities. So what we're doing is here is we're, we're defaulting to open, right? We're, we're saying you can do anything you want. If you want to go, I don't know, rent an office building, you have the authority to do it as long as it doesn't violate another rule. Um, now, there are rules in place around resource allocation. You can't dispose of company assets without following a certain process. Um, there are checks in place to make sure that you don't cause harm. But when you go to do something now, it's, exp it's explicitly written down. You have the authority to do it unless it violates another rule. And if you do something that another role doesn't like, they have the ability to create rules to put speed bumps in your path for the future. Also under Authority of Act, it says, you cannot exert control or cause material impact within a domain owned by another role, like the example of the metric in the data collection circle, um, by, owned by any other sovereign entity unless you have their permission. So in your case, you could go to the you could go to the role and say, hey, I intend to impact your domain. I'm going to change this metric. And they could either say yes or no. And we actually use language like that, like, hey, I intend to. 
Just state your intention. If anyone has a problem, they'll stop you. But again, we're defaulting to open, right? We're defaulting to yes. And this is a saying that, um, that we use a lot in, in Holacracy that just kind of just kind of drives it home. Be a Ferrari. Um, if we need to slow you down, we'll put speed bumps in your way. But in an environment where people can't get anything done, be a Ferrari, and if we need to slow you down, we will. This is how you get people to think like a startup. It's not reckless, it's fast, and it's safe. Well, we can talk more about that. Like my personality is like jumping on it. Like wearing the color, I'm ready to go. But I don't like that phrase excites me. But I feel like there are people in our organization who it like super doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that this works well with certain personality types, or can it work with everyone? So or? I think it can work with everyone. I think it does work better with some personality types than others. Oh, yeah, just um, yep, I think that management hierarchy works better in like Western business in general, works better with some personality types than others. I think a lot of people are, um, what's the word, minimized, marginalized, because they don't you know, speak loud enough or do certain things that a particular personality type does, right? Using this system, everyone gets a voice. So even those marginalized people, even if they are risk, risk adverse, they still have the opportunity to, to say what the risk is um, and even to argue their position in certain cases. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it does appeal to a certain type of person. I mean, that's why I gravitate to it. I also think that there is um, there's a personal learning journey in it for people if they're wi willing, to, willing to take it. So when, when you're, if you're risk adverse and someone says, hey, I'm going to try this thing, and you shut down, well, okay, let's look into that. Now, where is that coming from? Is it really a concern that the action's gonna cause harm to the organization or move the circle backwards? Or is it something else? Right now, we don't even have the language to talk about this stuff in our businesses, right? So if we can start to get some of this stuff going, we can at least open up those conversations, and it might make people uncomfortable. I would argue people are already uncomfortable. Um, but by, by making it safe to surface stuff, we can start to actually get transformation. But you have to change the structure. You have to change the environment, what, the, what you would call the culture. Um, I think of culture as the, it's the shadow on the wall, right? You can't touch it, you can see it, but you can't change it directly. By starting to bring some of this language in, you can start to get some, some movement on that. Um, any other thoughts about the golden rule or role and soul? Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, working in the organization versus working, excuse me, on the organization. In most organizations, you are here. You work in the organization. When's the last time you actually worked on the organization, on its structure? Maybe, you're, maybe you have a new job rec and you need to like write a new job description and get it approved by your boss. Now you're starting to work on the organization. Um, in Holacracy, we're always thinking about working on the organization. It's actually our duty to take care of the organization, to, to improve it over time, to give it more capacity and capability. So what we want to do is we want to get you thinking about that. What does the organization need to have more capability? more capacity, what's missing? And towards the, end of the, towards the end, we'll talk about how you know to do that. Um, so how do we do this whole in-on thing? If you think about working in the organization, we call that tactical. Working on the organization is governance. Tactical happens every day, and we also have tactical meetings. Governance happens um, you're constantly referring to the governance records, looking stuff up, seeing who you need from what, what you need from who. Um, but you can think of it as split into processes and structures. The main processes are the governance meeting and the tactical meeting. I will pass these cards around so you can take a look at them. This is a governance meeting card. This is a tactical meeting card. It just describes the process. 
um, at a real high level here, and we could do a whole workshop on each of these topics, and that's something I would actually like to do someday. Um, governance meetings happen monthly. They're designed to increase the capacity of the circle to achieve its purpose and accountabilities. Anyone can update the roles, accountabilities, domains, and policies of the circle according to a process. And the work that happens in governance meetings can only be done in governance meetings. The reason for that is that we're dealing with the structure of the organization. We're, we're performing surgery, and everyone needs to be able to have a say in that. It doesn't happen in a back room. It happens in a meeting. The changes are documented. Um, and then on the other side of it, we have weekly tactical meetings. Tactical meetings remove obstacles to advance the work of the circle. Anyone can bring up topics in service of their roles, anyone. And work that happens in tacticals can also happen any time during your work with people. We're simply giving, uh, giving it a space to get things unstuck when they become stuck. And we also do things like report on metrics and checklist items in these tactical meetings so people know like, hey, we had six events last week, it's down two from the previous. That might cause someone to want to do something differently. Um, but it just, gives, it just gives this really lovely heartbeat to the organization when, you, when each team has a tactical meeting each week. Um, so those are the differences. Uh, some things that are the same in both of these things is that when you're in a meeting, whether it's governance or tactical, you're there to help your roles, not yourself. You can try to help yourself. The, the, the process will prevent it. The process is designed to be in service of the roles, not designed to like help the people specifically. But everyone will help you get what you need until you're satisfied. That really shakes some people up. In fact, there's a this is a good story. There's a there's a prison that's actually using holacracy to run the library, and the prisoners get a say in how the library runs. Right? They've got now they they're extremely constrained in terms of what they can do, but we go through the process. And the facilitator takes out the card and, and says to the person, OK, what do you need? And then you go through the process, and at the end, did you get what you need? And if not, you go back to the top. Um, the story goes that there was this one really like hardened criminal. I don't know exactly what his crime was, but the facilitator said, what do you need? And the guy just broke down in tears. No one had ever asked him what he needed before in his life. Um, this is a really, really civilized, healthy way to run a meeting. And the facility, if, you're, if you talk out of turn, the facilitator will shut you down. The facilitator is just a referee. They're just there to enforce the rules. They're neutral. Very different kind of facilitator energy. No empathy required. Um, so I mean, these meetings could be their own workshop. And if I could just teach people t like to do tactical meetings, I think it would make the world a much better place. So getting back to our diagram here. Uh, we have processes of governance and tactical for working in and on. And then we have structures that support that. We're just going to spend a few minutes on structure. Um, I don't want to get into too much detail on it. But basically, we have circles, which are whole, self-sufficient teams. Circles are composed of roles, several roles or one role. And a role has um, up to these three different attributes. Uh, it defines a job function. And it can have a list of accountabilities. That's things it's expected to do and things you can count on it for. And then it also can have domains, which is like property of the role that you must get permission to impact. Like, well, what are some examples of maybe some domains that you might want in your business? Because if there's no domain, remember, you have the authority to do anything you want to achieve your purpose and accountabilities. Get in on it. Yeah. Yep, that's a great example of where you might need a domain. Yeah, so to, to protect a client relationship, and you would actually it would actually say relationship with client X. That's my domain. And now, if someone wants to impact that, they need to talk to you first. What are, uh, what are some other things? Compliance with some sort of regulatory rule. Totally regulatory compliance. Yeah. How about the bank account? 
How about the office layout? What else might someone change that would be a problem? So many things. So many things, right. How about hiring? If you need to hire someone in service of your roles, you can do it, unless there's a policy that prevents it. How about firing? If someone's getting in your way, can you fire them? There's no rule against it. So it really makes you think about all these things. It's not implicit anymore. And it's not, un and I know this sounds like, you know, pie in the sky stuff. It's not unrealistic to expect an organization to define the things that, need, that you need permission for. There are some default domains, which are resources, money, um, any, any hard asset you can't dispose of without getting the permission of your circle lead, the person in charge of the circle. And there was one other thing. There's a default domain on role assignments, so only the circle lead can put people into roles. I think we talked about that in a sec. Um, so there are some special roles. Most of these roles are dynamic, they're different for each, each, each uh, organization, but every circle has a circle lead. It used to be called lead link, it just got renamed. The circle lead is what you might think of as a traditional manager, but they really only do a few things. They set priorities, and that just means they say, X is more important than Y. That's it. They don't tell you how to do the work, just this is more important than that. They assign people into roles, so they've got this body of roles that needs to be energized. It's work, the work has to be done. They are responsible for finding people to put into those roles. And then they allocate resources, and that's it. The rest of the work of the circle happens autonomously. With, and it doesn't happen on its own, obviously. The people are communicating with each other and figuring out how to break down the work, um, but according to a set of rules. You also have a facilitator. They're like a referee. Their job is to just maintain order. And you have a secretary. The secretary is um, accountable for maintaining the governance records in the meetings. They also have the authority to strike invalid governance. And they also have the authority to interpret governance. So let's say you're looking at your job descriptions, and you're not really sure if the metric falls under the data lead. In a traditional organization, what do you do? Go to their boss, or I don't know. Here, the secretary has the authority to make the call. So you could go to your secretary and say, hey, I need an, interpreta I need an interpretation here. Um, and they can give you that interpretation. So this is... Um, so we talked about kind of basic role structure. This is an example of a mature hallarchy, is what we call it. Fancy word, there's some fancy words in this. Um, and you can see it's just a bunch of circles organized into roles. This is the hallarchy for Holacracy One, the company I used to work for. And you can see we've got uh, a training circle, back office, glass frog, which is software, uh, ecosystem, that's like partnerships, um, the board of directors is outside of the entire thing. Um, and so you could think of this as a hierarchy, but it's a hierarchy of roles. And different people energize different parts of it. Like that diagram that I showed before where I'm energizing four out of the seven roles in my organization. Um, you might have 15 roles, 20 roles in this circle. You might have four people in actually doing work in the circle but they hold many roles. What this does when you separate role and soul is it, it allows you to, to get the organization what it needs, right? Let's make the role up and figure out what the role is. Okay, now we've got that role. Now who can fill that? We, we're, we're teasing things apart, we're making distinctions, we're separating things, and that gives us a ton more freedom when it comes to actually filling the roles. There are Great question. I, uh, I actually intentionally erased the legend because I didn't want to confuse people. Um, yes, so green circles are dynamic roles. Those are roles that are special for the organization. The kind of darker teal are core roles. Those are circle lead, facilitator, secretary. Also, there's also one called rep link that we didn't cover. White, I believe, are unfilled. So these are roles that are not filled in the organization. What do you think happens to the work of, of, of a role that's not filled in Holacracy, if you had to guess? It just doesn't get done? Does that sound like a good system? You have people who sort of um, make adjustments for a short-term and so you get 
you know, make adjustments for the short term. And that's, they, they, that's generally done by the circle lead. So the circle lead's responsible for picking up any slack that gets, they, you can think of the circle lead as the garbage collector of the circle. Anything that happens that doesn't get done, they do it. Just like in a real business. If you've ever been an entrepreneur, you're taking out the trash, you're talking to the clients, you're doing it all. But at some point, you get big enough and now you need somebody else to do that. You can create a role for it. And in fact, the circle lead has quite a bit of authority to create new roles because they're responsible for the overall health of the circle. Um, I'm talking a lot. So this is where we get the name holacracy. Uh, Holon it came from a book, it's a science fiction book. A holon is something that is both a part and a whole at the same time. Each of these circles is complete in and of itself and part of a larger whole at the same time. And that's why we call it a holarchy. I want to draw your attention to this circle down here. This is the marketing circle. If we zoom in on that, we can see all of the different job functions, different roles required by marketing. Was it you that said that you were involved with marketing? Does this look like maybe some things you might want to do in your circle? Maybe you have a business model around marketing or someone's responsible for lead generation or maybe you need some SEO. Right, so we can actually go in and define all these things and really get clear about what does this circle need, right? And you don't have to go begging people to do things or saying, oh, can you please just help me out with this thing? No, you make a role, you put someone in the role, they're accountable for doing it. You can count on it. So this is a mature circle, right? It's got 20 some roles. Um, they're all doing their thing. They've all got accountabilities, certain domains here and there. And they all know how to work with each other because it's all written down. If somebody leaves the organization, guess what? You didn't lose everything they know. <laughs> we've still got the descriptions of how they work. We've, still, we've still got notes attached to these things. Um, it, really helps, it, it really helps build the organization as a structure separate from the people. Yeah. Um, okay, so software. We're getting close to the end here. Software for um, supporting this practice. You could use a word processor. It doesn't have the st enough structure to really do a good job with this and to really help you along the way. Uh, there's four main tools out there, or three main tools. Glassfrog, which is from Holacracy One. Uh, Teal Dog, which is a product that I've, I've made that I think is easier to use, though not as complete as Glassfrog. I believe it's easy, easier to use, and I think that's a worthwhile trade-off to explore. There's also a tool called Holospirit, um, which is kind of a distant third, and there are others. So one more topic to talk about, and that is tensions. Um, tension processing. So this is a question that I would ask you a bigger room. Who's ever felt tension at work? All right, everyone. Um, who has a concrete, specific, and reliable way to resolve those tensions? Probably no one. Um, we think of tensions as negative. It's really, the, we, the reason we use the word tension here is because we want to reclaim the idea that attention is bad. Attention is simply something that is stretched. It means to stretch. That's the, the etymology of the word. Um, so I want to I want to talk a little bit, uh, spend a few minutes talking about tension processing. In most organizations, talking about tensions is avoided because we think attention is bad, and we're helpless to do anything about it anyway. So let's just not think about that because that will just be easier and safer and less stress. But what if we could reverse that narrative? What if we could turn tensions into the things that make the organization stronger? Just like when you go to the gym, progressive overload, lifting weights, bigger muscles. This is how organizations can increase their capacity. And the only way to do it that I know of is for people, not roles, to sense tensions in their roles and then make changes to, to affect the organization. So we make it healthy to process tensions. So in Holacracy, attention describes a person's felt sense that there's a gap between the current reality and a potential future. It's just a feeling that something could be different. Maybe we need a new role. Maybe the garbage isn't getting taken out. You know, anything like that. The tension itself is just a raw felt sense of dissonance before we label it as positive or negative. 
Now, I know it can be hard to go into work tomorrow and say, OK, guys, everyone bring up your tensions. Let's go. Right? Um, if you want to use a different word for it, you can try. I don't know. I would love to find a way to make this more palatable. But just linguistically, tension is the best word that we have for this. And we want to reclaim it. So what do you call an organism that has no tension? Dead. Dead, Dead exactly. <laughs> That's exactly it. Tensions are the stuff of life. Without tension, nothing happens. Tensions are the fuel for organizational change. And tensions are valuable. Um, so to quote the Constitution, and this kind of goes back to what you were asking about, do people have a responsibility to do this? Um, you are responsible for monitoring how your roles, purpose, and accountabilities are expressed and comparing that to your vision of their ideal potential expression to identify gaps between the current reality and a potential you sense. Each gap is a tension. You are also responsible for trying to resolve those tensions by using the authorities and other mechanisms available to you under this constitution. Um, so Holacracy gives you quite a few ways to process attention. We're not going to go through all of this. But I just want to put this up to show you that there are many pathways and that you're not helpless. I'm not just asking you to sense attention and then sit with it forever. Um, we can talk a little bit about this. Don't use Holacracy to solve personal That's right. And that's a really good distinction. Is this a personal tension or is it an organizational tension? Right there, that alone could change your whole, your whole organization. Um, so something happens in the world, you sense attention, and now you ask yourself, it, does it affect somebody else's role? Well, now tell them, pitch them. Um, give them an argument for why it makes sense to them to care about that. Not why you think they should, but why does it make sense for their role? Appeal to their role, right? So it's not about... It's not about you know vomiting your problems on someone. It's about getting getting their get, like seeing if you can get them to understand. Um, and if they don't, great. You know then you can't do anything with that. Now is it really your attention? It's, this is this just gets into all this kind of stuff about vulnerability and personal boundaries and um, if it affects your role, okay. Well then we're onto something. And in the tactical meeting, we've basically got it broken down to four things. Do you need information? Do you want to share information? Do you need resources? Or do you need someone else to do something? This is really what every request comes down to. And it might seem oversimplified, but once you actually start working with this system, it really all comes down to those four things. And then if you want to change the roles, you go to a governance meeting. Do you want to expect something on an ongoing basis? Make a new role. So drastically oversimplified, but I just want to show you that um, I'm not just asking people, Holacracy doesn't just ask you to sense your tensions and then, and then leave you helpless. There are many pathways to process tensions. So that is uh, basically it for the most of the content here. One thing I want to leave you with, a couple things I want to leave you with. If you're interested in learning more, don't read the Constitution. Reading the Constitution is like reading the 153-page FIFA rule book to learn how to play soccer. Uh, the Constitution is a reference for when you need to figure something out, a specific case. It's, a, it's the operating system. The Holacracy book is really good. It's like five hours of audio if you prefer to read it like I do. Um, and it's a really fun read, too. It really talks about the story in a really nice way. Um, so definitely don't read the Constitution. <laughs> I, mean, I, spent, I just spent an hour and a half telling you about the Constitution. I'm telling you don't read it. But. Um, so I just want to leave you with a few thoughts here. Holacracy in its full expression is structural change for organizations. It turns every team into a startup. It puts the responsibility of change on each person and doesn't give them any excuses. It holds a mirror to smallness and continually invites growth and adaptation. It stops treating people like children. It brings civility and rule of law to our organizations and gives us the same sense of freedom we experience as citizens of a republic. Millions are spent developing leadership, but for the majority of us, we work in environments that are toxic to any real expression of leadership. Even if you learn something useful at a workshop, keeping it alive at work is an uphill battle at best. 
Sexism is still rampant. People step on each other to advance their careers. There's infighting in politics. None of that is necessary. You can align yourself with your purpose, align your purpose with your organization's purpose. Choose roles that express your purpose and serve the organization. You can free your employees to do the same. You and the organization can try new things, experiment, learn, and do it safely. Um, that concludes my diatribe. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Um, that, that last part, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't figure out how to get the presentation to communicate what I wanted to without just putting those slides in. Um, so we've got a few minutes for questions. We can also talk about next steps. Uh, if you're interested in checking this out more, uh, I would encourage you to read the book, talk to the people around you about it, get into a conversation. Don't just stay in your head. Um, you can sign up for an account on Teal Dog and start making up, making up some roles, playing around, just getting your feet wet. It's free. Um, you can document your organization's roles in Teal Dog. Um, real easy. You can also start running tactical meetings. That's a fairly low-hanging fruit. Uh, I can talk to you more about how to do that if you're interested. And you can also just assign a role in your organization to, to write the governance and then try to get something, try to just start moving from implicit to explicit, and see what happens. Um, you're welcome to reach out to me, j at teal.dog. Uh, sign up for an account. Uh, Holacracy One has the best training on this in the world. Um, you can attend an online taster workshop where you actually get to get an experience of doing some of this work um, in a tactical meeting and in a governance meeting. And there's also an online community of practice where you can ask questions and hang out with other people that are doing Holacracy. Um, and you can also check out my YouTube channel where I talk about this stuff a lot.